let's actually jump right into the the demo that we have today. Chapter six deals with the image data set. So uh, this is the actual code base that is designated for chapter six. This is not the demo for today. Um, but I did want to show, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, code that goes in to um, each of these chapters. This chapter goes through uh, how to vectorize images into fixed length vectors using techniques like histograms of oriented gradients or hogs, uh, which are more of a classical method of extracting features from an image, but still used in production today. Um, uh, using mean pixel values or hog values, or and this ends with using a um, a deep learning model called VGG11. Uh, VGG11, the Visual Geometry Group 11, is a convolutional neural network that is uh, pre-trained on a, a corpus called ImageNet. So it's pre-trained to already be able to recognize a bunch of images. Well, then we'll then use it to further fine tune it on our data set to, um, to, uh, to get better results on it. Let's actually go straight to our uh, example today. Our example today is actually not found in the book. So this is actually totally new content built specifically for the stream, uh, but I will be putting it up with the resources for the book. So if you wanna see the resources for this, you're gonna have to get the book. In chapter six, we do a relatively straightforward um, use case of classifying object, uh, doing object detection, basically classifying what object is in the image, uh, which is, you know, if you think about image task, that's a pretty common one, right? Here's an image, what's in it? What is this an image of? We're gonna extend that slightly today. And, and instead of saying what's in the image, we're going to use the same architecture, VGG11, to, um, extract features from pieces of art in order to make an art recommendation engine. Now, you're hearing art recommendation engine, and I don't want everyone to get, oh, he's gonna talk about collaborative filtering, content-based filtering. No, for that, you have to buy my other book, Principles of Data Science. Uh, today is going to be a much more uh, pruned down version of a recommendation engine where we are basically going to be extracting um, uh, features from our art pieces. And then given an art piece that you already like, we wanna suggest art pieces of a similar style. And you're thinking, okay, well, easy enough. Just if, if I have an image, just share an image that has a very similar embedding and therefore they'll be similar. But no, here's where I want to make my case. If you just take a pre-trained model like VGG11 or ResNet or Vision Transformer or what have you, whatever it is, trained on something like SIFAR or ImageNet or um, some other object detection data set, those types of models are looking for content in an image. What is in the image? They're not looking for style of the image. And when people are uh, looking for new pieces of art, more often than not, they don't care what's really in the art piece, like that's a frog or that's a person. They are mostly caring about the style of the art piece. Is this a style that I like? Is this a style of art that I want hung up in my own home? That's what they care about. So we need to classify or be able to at least uh, extract features that are most indicative of style in an art piece. So that's going to be our goal today. Our data set uh, is actually going to come directly from a public, uh, publicly accessible website called Artsy. If you're not familiar with Artsy, it's basically an art marketplace. It's pretty good at what it does. They're all right. But one thing they do have that is very, very useful for us today is something they call the Art Genome Project. Think like the Music Genome Project that Pandora did, I don't know, 10 years ago now at this point obviously all based on the human genome project that came before. The art genome project is, is more or less uh, just a classification of their art pieces in uh, over a thousand categories. And those categories range from 19th century art to 18th century art to uh, bowls, like B-O-W-S. B-O-W-L-S is a category. 
Baroque is a category that I have um, up on the screen right now. Uh, so our, our goal, uh, and, I, and I've done the, the fun part of, of, of obtaining a data set of tens of thousands of art pieces and their associated category, their associated uh, gene, so to speak. Their, what style is this uh, painting in? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually fine tune a VGG11, this, this convolutional neural network, to classify images to their associated style. And when we do this, this is the feature engineering part, as we fine tune a VGG11 model to recognize style, the feature values, and the, rather the way the model uh, VGG11, the way that it will output features for an image, it will be forced to output features that are necessary to recognize style. So when I give it a, a painting that I like or a, a piece of art that I like, the features that it will obtain after fine tuning it to style should be more representative of the style of the painting itself. So if I were to do some kind of a vector similarity operation, like a cosine similarity of those vectors, I should start to see uh, uh, art pieces of a similar style. As opposed to if I had just used like a pre-trained model, it would just give me uh, images that look the same. And again, that's what we're trying to avoid here. Neural networks that have been trained on ImageNet or Safar, they are more likely to give features that say, hey, these two images look the same. Therefore, these vectors are close to each other. I don't want that. I want these two art pieces are of a similar style, therefore their vectors are close together. That's what I want. So one way to do that, and there are many ways to do this, by the way, you could, we can make a Siamese network to train those models with a cosine similarity loss. That's totally possible. Um, I do that with text data all the time, with BERT all the time. Uh, but one way to do that, a simpler way to do that is to train a classifier to classify style. So we have this, this whole part here that's gonna take in our image on the left, run through a bunch of convolutions, bunch of pooling and soft, uh, fully connected, uh, ReLU uh, activation, softmax, blah, 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 right? All the way to this end here where we do a classification. I'm gonna cut off everything until the classification to just take the uh, feature embeddings and then use those to uh, compare images to each other. So let's do it. Scrolling down in this notebook, and again, this notebook will be available in the book resources. We have a couple imports here where we're just going to import pretty much everything all at once. Uh, we're going to be using something called Torch Vision, which is the same library that we'll use in the book. Uh, Torch Vision is uh, a PyTorch extension uh, that has a lot of methods and models specifically for vision encoding and, and vision work. So obviously it's a, it's a good fit for what we're doing today. Uh, we'll import basically Torch, PyTorch on its own, matplotlib, um, the optimizers, because we are going to be fine tuning a deep learning model and NumPy. And obviously in the, in the hopefully less than an hour that it takes to do all this, um, I'm not going to be explaining the like the basics of how to run through a deep learning code, but I'm going to like talk through briefly like what all what all the lines of code mean. But I'm unfortunately not going to have time to like re-explain how stochastic gradient descent works and what optimizers are and what loss functions are. So I'm going to kind of go ahead and assume that you either don't care, you just want to see this work, or you you do care and already have an idea about it, but that's not the point of the session. I got little comments to myself for a little answer. I'll probably I'm probably gonna add to this before I actually upload it to the GitHub, but this is this is like the first pass. I have little notes to myself <laughs> to for like interesting ways to extend uh, extend upon this. What you're not gonna go through and read derived back propagation? I mean, if you want, totally right. I mean, we can you know I'll, I'll even go one step further. I'll prove we can even prove that. Uh, directional, how to use directional derivatives to show that the negative gradient is the actual just uh, direction you want to go for the fastest decrease in your loss function. I'll even go that far. Okay, don't test me. I have I have a bunch of math tattoos proving all kinds of stuff. So.
Don't test me. Okay. So one thing that we're going to be using that's really useful from the from the uh, from PyTorch is uh, something called the image folder. So this uh, this data is actually uh, formatted the way uh, most of this data is going to be formatted is going to be like this. We have a training and a testing set, um, a folder. And inside of each of those folders, we have other folders that are the names of the actual categories themselves, so 15th century, whatever. Inside of those folders, we actually have the images that, uh, that are from Artsy. That's basically how the, the art pieces are organized. And similarly, in the, oops, in the training set, same classes, same all of that, just the actual, the training set that we will use. So this is um, obviously going to be a much bigger uh, data set in the training than it is in the testing. And there's a lot of categories, as we will see. Uh, there are over a thousand categories to, to, to train from. And we got, you know, Dutch and Flemish stuff. Look how cool. All right. And again, you could use your own data set for this. Like, it's whatever you want to do, right? It's, it's however you want to organize this. But this code is pretty much copy and pasteable to whatever you got. We will load up our images and we're also going to pass through a compose um, operation. A compose operation is going to compose a bunch of transformations and we're going to run those transformations on each of our images. So in this case, for each of our images, we're going to transform them to be 100 by 100 pixels. We're going to turn them into a tensor which will actually um, uh, turn them from values from zero to 255 for their RGB values to be between zero and one. And then we're gonna normalize. These are actually, if you like go a, do a Google search for these values, these are like known um, normalization parameters that most people use when working with images. So uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. This is not me being super smart and saying, I found these to be the best. No, this is this is a very standard, industry standard set of parameters to use. So we have our uh, training and testing set. We are gonna set our batch size to 128. Setting your batch size is, is always kind of like a, um, not a weird question, but I, I usually think, uh, think back to the authors of the original papers. So actually the authors of this original paper would probably recommend something closer to 32 or 64 <laughs> batch size. Um, I chose 128 just because we have a pretty huge data set. Um, I think we're actually in the, I mean, we're in the tens of thousands of images here, if I recall. You know, let's find out. Doing it live. We have 38,000. Um, and I could have just done simpler math to do this, but we have 55,000 art pieces here. That's a lot. <laughs> and, you know, our, our uh, images, rather, it's going to take a lot of our memory. Uh, so we, we want to not take too many at a time, but at the same time, we want this to, you know, wrap up. And I'll, I'll spoiler alert to run 20 epochs took my laptop about eight hours on the CPU. So this is kind of slow. <laughs> this is not as slow as what's in the, uh, rather not as fast as what's in the book. The book is uh, much uh, simpler and smaller images. And in fact, the VGG original paper recommends we use 224 by 224 images. If that's not necessary. Uh, you'll notice that we're using 100 by 100 in ours. You can use technically whatever square size you want. Um, uh, 32 by 32 was too pixelated in my opinion. So I chose a hundred as like a medium to hopefully speed up, to, to speed up training basically. We have our data set and we have our data loader. So our data loader is just an object in PyTorch that takes in a data set and then loads batches of data given a batch size. So nothing crazy. So if we load our, uh, if we load our first batch from our training data loader, we get 128 because that's our batch size, three channels of color, uh, and then 100 by 100 pixels. So 300 pixels are, sorry, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> uh, we have uh, our last three dimensions, is what I meant to say. Last three dimensions are actually the uh, pixels related to the images. Um, this 128 is just the batch size. And do note that the, the channels is the first dimension here. And that's not always the case so in, in, in matplotlib, as you'll see here. Uh, it, it generally expects the channels to be the last one. So we'll have to transpose it just to show um, any of the, the actual images. Then we're going to go ahead and instantiate a VGG model. We can either instantiate a, a one that is pre-trained or not. 
I'm going to take one that was pre-trained on ImageNet. And that's because I do want it to start from some place of understanding what images look like, right? You know, like I said, when it's pre-trained only on something like ImageNet or Safar, it's going to do pretty well at just under recognizing what images look like in general. But that's not going to be enough to do our actual style recommendation, but it's a good place to start. So what we're going to do is to make our model, to change our model to be what we need, the first thing we're going to do is our, our original set of output features is a thousand because that's how many classes there are in the ImageNet database. However, our database is actually more than that. So we're going to actually go ahead and just flat out change and I, let me actually show you the, the the classifier of the vgg model looks like this we have a linear layer that takes in um our our data from the convolutional side we output the four four thousand ninety six vector uh does another um feed forward network and then ends with a squashing to this should say a thousand because if it were the original it'd be a thousand ours is a thousand and eleven so we're going to actually change this to be to literally change the classifier's last layer, this one, to take in the original 4096 from the previous layer and then output our number of feature or classes, which is 1011. Then uh, I'm going to reinitialize all of the parameters in my classifier layer, but not in the feature extraction layer. So all of these features are safe. I'm not going to touch any of these. They're going to get updated during the training process but I'm not going to reinitialize them. These ones in blue and yellow, I am going to reinitialize to be random again. Uh, I'm basically saying, hey, classifiers start from scratch because all those classes that you learned previously don't matter anymore. But all that stuff you learned about images, remember that. So this is us changing that model to be out to, to work for our use case. And this is exactly what we do in the book as well. Then we get to the kind of the nitty gritty of, of deep learning training. We are going to set our criteria, which is going to be across entropy loss, which for those of you who are aware, uh, that is pretty much the most common loss for doing a classification task. So we're going to stick with across entropy loss. We're going to use stochastic gradient descent as opposed to something like Adam um, with our parameters. Uh, I have a learning rate here of 0.01 and 0.9. I'll be honest, I didn't try super hard to hyper parameter, uh, hyper parameter tune uh, these parameters, but they are what they are. Uh, I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, 20 epochs. So why 20? So a lot of times people will tell you, hey, well, if you're doing transfer learning, you shouldn't be doing that many epochs. And I, I, I generally agree with you because that's true. But in this case, we have a humongous data set and we have a lot of classes. This is not like fine-tuning BERT to do a binary classification or, or, or fine-tuning ResNet to do uh, some kind of like a 10-class a category categorization. We have over 1,000 labels, and, and we have over 55,000 images overall. And this is going to take a lot of training. Uh, this is going to take uh, at least 20 epochs to actually... Uh, and this also, the task we're doing is complicated. You know, object detection is relatively simple because objects tend to look the same, for the most part, objects tend to look the same across different images. Style is subjective, and it is up to the eye of the beholder to actually recognize and dictate what is the style of this piece. And you may be totally, 19th century, in my opinion, sorry, Artsy, isn't a style, it's a time period, right? I would, I would arguably have put pieces in the 19th century under more descriptive style categorizations. But I didn't write the data set, so I'm going to have to go along with the data set on this one. Uh, I'm going to print outputs every 50 steps so it's not destroying my notebook output. Um, uh, I, I am going to be defining a pretty low level training loop uh, just for the sake of teaching. This is actually pretty much the exact same loop in the book that I explain as well. And yeah, so the, the loop itself is going to first set your device if you are um oh and also i don't like um if i use if i use inspiration from another blog post i, I i'm always going to include it because um i'm not going to try to claim this is my my personal uh all of this is my personal code uh entirely like from my own you know just sitting down and doing nothing i've obviously gotten inspiration from other people in my life this particular code was inspired by uh, something I saw from, from Pluralsight. 
So I did want to give them a little shout out there. And this, theirs was specifically about ResNet, uh, but I altered it to be about VGG11 and for our use cases in the book. So inspired by not <laughs> copy and paste it from. So we do set our device. So if you do have a GPU, this should work. I, I'll be honest, I haven't tested this on a GPU, but it should work as is by detecting the device. All right, and if you have CUDA installed and properly, set our model to train mode, uh, run over our 20 epochs, uh, set our running losses to zero. Uh, and then for each batch, so we're gonna uh, iterate over our data loader, our PyTorch data loader, we'll load up batches of 128 uh, images at a time. Send our data to the target device. So in my case, it'll be CPU, but in your case, it may not be, it could be GPU. Zero out the gradients. This is a, if you're a PyTorch <laughs> deep learning developer, you, you're, you're right at home. So we're gonna zero out the gradients. We're gonna run our data through the VGG model. We're gonna grab our loss, our calculation from our criterion, which is our cross entropy loss. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and do a dot backwards, backward propagate our, our parameters. Uh, and remember that our, our criterion did take in our parameters as a parameter to the actual class. So it knows what parameters to update. And it's all, it does all that fun stuff for us. Then we take a step in our optimizer, again, in the in the direction of the negative gradient, because that's, that's the direction you gotta go. That's the fastest of steepest descent. Thank you, directional derivatives and uh, dot product cosine similar, uh, not similarity, but you know, the relationship between cosines of angles and uh, dot products. See, I know the proof. Then we add to our running loss, we will um, calculate the accuracy, uh, the number of, uh, number of accurate predictions that we made. Uh, and then if we hit our number of steps, 50 at a time, we're gonna go ahead and print what epoch we're on, what step we're on, what our current running loss is, and uh, go from there. We basically do that. And then after every epoch, we more or less do the exact same thing for our evaluation set. So uh, importantly, we set, uh, with Torch no grad, so don't even think about gradients, like don't worry about it. If you have an M1 chip, like I do, if you don't do the no grad, it will cause a huge memory leak, FYI. So be aware if you are, if you are actually using this just for uh, evaluation purposes, you can run into a memory leak issue. You should be really uh, cautious and use no grad and eval as much as you can. So with no gradients, we're gonna set our model back to back to an eval position. Uh, so no training, uh, basically do the same thing, run over our testing data loader, set, send our data to our device, run it through the model, calculate our loss, add it to our batch loss, calculate our um, running accuracy of our testing set uh, and go ahead and add those values to a running list so we can keep track of them over the epochs. And then if our loss is greater than our, our, our saved loss, which if you recall, this was set to infinity at first, it saves a parameter every time our network learns. And this is based on the uh, uh, validation uh, loss. Every time our network learns, we save the parameters. And we run it. And I've already pre-run this just because it takes, God, it took a long time. Starts off with loss around eight, which is pretty bad. <laughs> and ends up after um, about, I had to stop it short actually, um, ends up uh, hitting close to three and uh, two actually. So when, I, when I ran this last night, it got down to a, a loss of about two. So it, it, it was definitely um, getting there. The problem, however, is if you look at the validation loss, the validation loss started at about 6.8 and ended at around 5.9. So it got lower, which is good. I, don't get me wrong. I'm happy with that. I would argue that it, it could get even lower, but here's the thing. It's not about the model anymore. This is about the data uh, and not necessarily feature engineering. This is about just basic data engineering. Like uh, when I was, when I was looking at this data set, there are a lot of categories here uh, that only have one element in it. <laughs> so uh, and again, taking it from 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 artsy. So I, I, my point is, not everything is going to be uh, perfect. Um, and uh, if I had, if I was actually doing this with more time, and this was my actual job, I would take the time to actually shorten up the number of categories that I'm working with. And I actually put that as um, uh, as a oh, that's interesting. There's a CAD 
Sorry, I'm, I'm also I also like I feel like I I, I go through this data set every time. And I'm like that's a weird it's a weird category to have. All right. <laughs> so after our training loop, if we run our uh, loss, our validation loss, we can see that we do start to go down, and then after around epoch 14, it starts to go up again. So our model has hit a limit. Uh, our model's hit a limit and be like, I can't, this is all I got for you. Um, our training set accuracy went from a, a beautiful about 0% all the way to a, a staggering 6%. And 6%, whoa, Sanam, that must be horrible. This You must be really bad at this. No. Again, the goal of this is not to classify art pieces to a style to a near perfect degree. Because again, style is subjective, data set's pretty dirty. That's not my goal. My goal is to train a VGG model to extract features. This is a feature learning technique. This is of the, of the five kinds of feature engineering. This is feature learning. Learning basically is I'm, I'm setting up an environment for a deep learning model to learn features for me. I am putting it in a situation where it is being forced to learn features, to try and learn features, to actually perform a task that I wanted to do. So let's say we do this, and then two weeks later, someone wants to use our model. We would perform a couple more imports, uh, instantiate our model, make sure we change our model to be uh, the right number of targets at the end, uh, 1,011. And then we're going to load our model parameters. Uh, so this will actually update all of our parameters to be our fine-tuned parameters that we just learned in our uh, training loop. And if we take a look, everything looks everything looks good. So then here's how we'll implement an actual recommendation engine. And again, this is there are books on recommendation engines. You should read those if you want to build an actually good production-ready recommendation engine. My part's basically done. <laughs> I've I've learned the features that I think we can learn. Uh, and to actually do a recommendation engine, all we're going to really do is load up our testing data set. Um, uh, we actually don't need this one. Just our testing data set here. We're going to embed every single image in our, our testing data set uh, based on the features that we learned during the VGG11 training loop. Uh, we end up with a, a, a vector of 512. Why 512? Well, going back to our visualization of the actual model, uh, 512 is this red layer right here, this max pooling uh, right here. Um, there's, there's two basic ways of extracting features from a VGG11. You could either take the 4096 dimensional vector uh, here, uh, this blue part here, which is used right before the actual classification layer, or what I've done in this example is I've taken the 512 dimensional vector, which is actually a three by three by 512, and I've averaged the pixel values to make it a 512 dimensional vector. Why, in my experience, I, have, I find it pretty useful to use the features at this layer um, because these blue layers are prepping the features to be classified but we're not classifying it. I want the raw interpretation of the image, which is best found at this red layer. Because these blue layers, these classifier layers, are the layers that take the raw understanding of the image and then squash them down into features useful for classification. But I want the raw understanding of the image, not the features necessary to make the actual classification. You could use both. <laughs> I think it's better to use the red one, but I think you could you could you would get good results also by using the blue features. Neither is wrong. You should always test both of them. It's not that hard to test both of them. You should test both. So I took the 512. Yep. And I took this image here. Let's say I let's say I like this image. Okay. Let's say. Uh, I don't know what it's called. Doesn't matter. I don't know the style of it. I'm just a guy in a gallery or in a museum, and I'm like, I like this one. Uh, I wish I could see things of a similar style. What I could do then is I could, uh, I would have to run this image through our transposition, or rather our, our composition transformations, and it would look something like this. So clearly you can kind of see like, okay, so one thing that in my case, maybe I do want to use a 224 by 224. Maybe I do want to use um, a, a bigger picture val pixel value. Um, it doesn't look exactly like it started to look uh, its original image,
because we've done some transformations to it. I could classify this. Like if I asked my VGD 11, it would say this is contemporary art, which I feel like is a pretty fair <laughs> assessment. I would argue of this actual image here. It's contemporary art. I could then take the vector representation of this image, run a cosine similarity across all of the testing images, and then sort it to get the top five closest images. Um, if I did that, these are the top five closest images in style. Again, I, I didn't train it to look at what looks the same. I trained it to recognize style. So in theory, after my, you know, this took me like a, an hour and a half to actually write, so it's not the best recommendation code in the world, but these images were given a similar vector representation when performing the task, hey, what are style recommendations? What are style recognitions? And, you know, sure, it's not giving me things of the Baroque nature. It's not giving me things from the Renaissance. It's not giving me this thing it classified as contemporary art, this thing that looks like this. You know, it's not giving me a sculpture. It's not giving me like a, a bust of a person. It's not giving me a bowl. It's not giving me a statue. It's it's giving me things that I could argue are of a similar style. Like if I like that, yeah, I could like this as well. And yeah, that's my basic uh, demo.